Good morning once again. It is 1.58 a.m. this August 8th, 2021, and welcome data scientists, analysts, biostatisticians, informatics, epidemiologists, policymakers, and data-oriented friends alike to our 43rd week of uh, reporting on the COVID event. And to start off with, I want to bring attention to the news that was broken by Bloomberg as follows. We'll just read the headline through. CDC scaled back hunt for breakthrough cases just as the Delta variant grew. The Bloomberg reporters also discovered as follows. They identified more than 100,000 vaccine breakthroughs, which was about 10 times higher than was originally uh, estimated by the CDC. Now I'm going to bring you to a little quote you may find quite intriguing, which probably did not hear on the news as we were put, pitting each other against each other's throats in order to what was called fear messaging. Uh, so let us begin. Let's get past that fear. Quote, that meant that unlike with previous variants, vaccinated people are more likely to spread the disease more easily to unvaccinated individuals or those who are vaccinated but vulnerable because of their age or health. It is a new dynamic that punches a hole in the wall of immunity in the U.S. that has been building to cordon off a stamp out the virus. Let's just read that clearly. Let me say it once again. That meant, unlike with previous virus variants, vaccinated people are more likely to spread the disease more easily to unvaccinated individuals or those who are vaccinated but vulnerable because of their age or health. All right, I'm going to leave it at that real fast. Let's go into the stories that we will be covering today, uh, and then we'll come back to this right at the, right the get-go. First, a disclaimer. We're going to be covering the VARES database. VARES database, just our information reported to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System from the CDC. If there are like 5,000 survey cases reported to the CDC, that doesn't mean there's 5,000 server cases. It means there's 5,000 cases to be researched and validated or confirmed by CDC officials. Now, we do kind of have a feather on a cap. We were more accurate than the CDC in predicting the death total. And now I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but we were saying, you know, 5,700 fatalities reported to the CDC. CDC was saying 12,000. Uh, the CDC finally corrected its number and said 6,000 fatalities to the CDC. Now keep in mind, we said 5,500 plus. The reason being is because they're including all the vaccine events from 2020 up to today. We're only including the vaccine events from the beginning of 2021 up to today. All right, so what we'll be doing is covering, of course, the VARES database. We are going to be covering as well the European Adverse Database. And we'll be looking at the reactions that they are having. Believe it or not, due to the European Union and their economic zones, they have had 802,786 reactions reported to their adverse uh, database, adverse database, suspect, suspected adverse drug reaction report. Again, it's two. 2 a.m. All right, other information we'll be covering as follows. Uh, I really like to bring your attention to the med page today. Great article uh, from this gentleman here. Uh, you know, for example, he points out that 26 of the 28 predicted models gathered by the CDC in January when things were going haywire couldn't predict accurately, even within a range of possibility, what would happen two weeks later. Wonderful article uh, and also med page today. Great information source. Uh, we're going to get information from VARES data. We're going to get information from the GIS aid and re reference the variants. We are going to be getting, or be getting uh, information as well from healthdata.gov and also to our world and data. But we're going to cite them towards the end because I don't want to mess up all these links right now because it may make it go away and have to start over again. So we'll look at those are information sources as follows. Uh, potential COVID-19 medication found among taborum drugs. We'll be covering licensed drug to reduce SARS-CoV-2 infection by up to 70% reveal study. This is a really cool study. Antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 remain stable or even increase 
seven months after infection. This is natural infection, and they found out the common cold may actually play a role. LED lights, I want to skip right over this once again real fast, but I'm a big proponent of utilizing LED light in order to prevent disease mitigation, and I am still shocked and befuddled in reference to our particular bureaucratic establishment not utilizing safe UV light in public arenas to mitigate uh, schools and so on and so forth to just get rid of the virus. I don't know why they're dragging their feet on that, but the rest of the world is using this and it looks pretty cool. And also too, those with immunocompromised uh, situations, uh, especially this, but uh, those in this case, for example, flare-ups in reference to rheumatic and mucoskeletal diseases, uh, one out of 10, per se, will get a flare-up, just to be aware. I want to cover that real fast. So let us begin, and also, too, data-wise, we will be covering, let me get rid of that real fast, da, da, da. We'll be covering, da, look at that, the VAERS database. It may not come up. It's processing really slow. For example, this is the number of uh, myocarditis reactions uh, that needs verification. It's been reported to the VAERS database. Right now, it's uh, basically held up on thrombosis. I don't know why it's taking so long, but hopefully it speeds up. We'll be looking at the mutations as far as how they affect each one in the United States, reference to positivity, mortality, so on and so forth. Uh, just a heads up, so we don't have to go back to this again. Uh, this is the percentage of fully vaccinated individuals so far in the United States, if you go by state. This is the size of the database currently. A lot of us look at the zip file size of the various database to see how much data or how many reactions have been reported to VAERS that, I don't know how many CDC officials they have to go through this information, but this gives you an idea of all the reactions every single year. And we're just a little bit over halfway through 2021. And that's the size of the database from all the reactions reported to VARES. So then we're going to go into the uh, European bases, da da da, the rebuild, and the VARES, da da da. Let's just go straight into the data first. All right, here we go. Ba ba ba. Do, 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 do. CDC scale back comfort breakthrough. This was a Bloomberg report. While Centers for Disease Control and Prevention stopped comprehensively tracking what are known as vaccine breath breakthrough cases in May. See, this is the reason this information is pertinent is because the claims initially that, you know, certain bureaucratic officials were misguided in reference to the uh, immunological protection provided by vaccines. And I am not going to guess what that level is one way or the other. Uh, and they said some statements which are probably erroneous and obviously uh, not based upon data. You know, some parts of my words there. All right, that's how come we have not been censored after 43 reports on this. Actually, this is the 43rd. So the reason being, if the vaccines are not up to par, they could be called what's considered leaky vaccines. And we are going to correlate, not a causative argument, to correlate the potential of what could occur in reference to leaky vaccines. But let's first proceed with this. And while the CDC has stopped tracking such cases, so when they say, for example, the breakthrough cases and so on and so forth are minor, reality, they don't have, the, what Bloomberg is pointing out here, is they don't have the data uh, available to them to really make uh, a fully accurate statement because it implies they're guessing off of uh, incomplete data collection, so the CDC. So let's see what Bloomberg found out. And while the CDSC has stopped tracking such cases, many states have not. Bloomberg gathered data from 35 states and identified 111,748 vaccine breakthrough cases at the end of July, more than 10 times the CDC's end of April tally. And proceed forward. The decision to stop tracking non-severe cases was made up, made up, but forgive me, made to help maximize the quality of data collected on the case's greatest clinical and public health importance. So they said for efficiency. You saw now going back and you look at this 
and you look at the this, all the cases they have to go through, and you have limited resources in human resources to weed through the data, per se. Uh, it's it's a consolidation of the resources where you find the most important because you can't cover everything. But that decision to not follow mild or asymptomatic cases is now being questioned, including by state officials dealing with the virus on the front lines. Quote, when I saw CDC was going to stop track and vaccinated people who get infected, my heart sank. Who helped lead the California's response to COVID as the state's health department assistant director. We lost our shot at being able to characterize how this variant is moving through the population and how new variants might emerge. You see what I mean? They lost the data. That meant that unlike with previous variants, vaccinated people are more likely to spread the disease more easily to unvaccinated. Now, with the data on hand currently, to caveat this, vaccinated individuals with pure conjecture, you know, looking at the data at the most positive light, uh, seem to be infected quick, uh, shorter. They seem to have the viral load drop faster, meaning they're not going to be as sick as long or have a serious illness as long as the unvaccinated. But that's not what we're going to be looking at. We're looking at transmission. Per proceed. Individuals who are vaccinated but vulnerable because of their age or health. The proportion of breakthrough cases remains tiny, they claim. All right, proceed forward. I want to be fair. Uh, South Carolina, Texas, Illinois no longer track breakthrough infections unless result in disease severe enough to be hospitalized or patients results in death. So again, you don't have the information fully available. Preliminary studies showed that many of them had levels of virus which are similar to unvaccinated people. That information went to validate and went to go real fast. Now, this is not to be knocking the whole situation. This is just to basically confirm information that's correlating with other information sources since no one's really keeping track. All right, this information we are reviewing from the latest study, Virological and Serological Kinetics of SARS-CoV-2 Delta Variant Vaccine Breakthrough Infections in a Multicenter Cohort. This is showing basically that the vaccine uh, is having a lot of breakthrough infections. And so, and it seems to be accelerating to some extent. So we look at the data that we had available here. Look at this little chart here. And for example, unvaccinated is the red line, the mean vaccinated breakthrough against the logistic regression. And you can see the comparison in days of illness. This is probably the fairest way to look at it. And so these are the vaccine breakthrough. So even though there are individuals that have breakthrough vaccines that are sick for 28 days, this is long, there's less. You see what I mean? Now, this is just looking at the line you see in vaccine, vaccinated breakthrough cases here, here, you know, higher viral loads and so on and so forth, bouncing all across the board. But that kind of goes in line with what Bloomberg was talking about. And uh, let's see if we're really fast. Yeah, let's look right here. Notably in contrast to existing studies that showed lower viral load in vaccinated patients, initial viral load indicated by PCR CT values was similar between vaccinated and unvaccinated patients with B6172. However, vaccinated patients appeared to clear viral load at a faster rate. All right, you, you see where the, the information is becoming very mixed. And this is important because somehow uh, through fear-related motivation, it kind of backfired on those trying to get people vaccinated. What ended up happening is it created a, a, a hostility towards individuals based upon their personal preference. Uh, they were trying to say this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Uh, that was really, really, uh, how would describe it, inappropriate language to utilize and serve no helpful purpose because now it appears that the viral loads are fairly similar between those two. And if we go back to the study referenced in Bloomberg, uh, individuals who have been vaccinated can, of course, uh, be just as contagious as someone without a vaccine. All right, so got to stop the hate between each other. Now, being vaccinated at this point in time does appear to show to reduce the severity of the disease. But however, though, I'm bringing all information into question because honestly, it there there's too many holes in all of the stories 
on all sides. But to proceed, following the news of Massachusetts breakthrough cases, Senator Edward Markey, a Democrat who represents the state, said the CDC should resume collecting data on all such cases. In a July 22nd letter to the CDC director, he asked her why the agency had stopped doing so and said the health officials and workers need robust data and information to guide their decisions. And that is to begin. I will link you to the Bloomberg article. I don't want to read all of it because I think it's not fair to Bloomberg to uh, uh, to hijack their article, but to bring attention to good to good reporting, uh, I will send you to Bloomberg. All right, now here is conjecture and hypothetical. It is a correlation. This is a problem with leaky vaccines, which was discovered back in 2015. Scientific experiments with herpes virus strain that causes Merrick's disease in poultry. All right, this, now follow me on this. Confirmed for the first time in the highly controversial theory that some types of vaccines allow for the evolution and survival of increasingly virulent versions of a virus. Does that mean it's going to happen in this case? No, it does not. Is it something to look out for? Yeah, it would be wise. Putting unvaccinated individuals at a greater risk of severe illness. Now, in this case, the authors from the PLOS of biology, what they're basically saying is, well, if you're unvaccinated, the vaccinated can actually make you more sick. You, you see the problem here? When a vaccine works perfectly, as do the childhood vaccines for smallpox, polio, mumps, rubella, and measles, it prevents vaccinated individuals from becoming sickened by the disease, and it also prevents them from transmitting the virus to others. These vaccines are perfect because, now I'm not pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, I'm just reading the data per se. These vaccines are perfect because they're designed to mimic the strong immunity that humans naturally develop after being exposed to one of these diseases. Our quoting, our research demonstrates that other vaccine types allow extremely virulent forms of virus to survive, like the one Merrick's disease in poultry, against which the poultry industry is heavily reliant on the vaccination for disease control. These vaccines also allow the virulent virus to continue evolving precisely because they allow the unvaccinated individuals and therefore themselves to survive. Now, now when you look at basically the COVID vaccines in immunological compromised individuals, and now I have no clue why, but it seems to target those with HIV the worst. I mean, the HIV individuals seem not to be able to clear the SARS-CoV-2 uh, viruses per se, uh, and therefore it tends to create mutating and create what's called a variance of concern. And I was going to cover that today, but our, 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 our videos become really long. And if you look at even HIV, they actually use HIV mutations to, to develop SARS viruses in order to test new SARS variants. We covered that a little while ago. So it, it, if people can't clear the virus, problematic. Quote, quote, our research, read it right here. Our research in, demonstrates that the use of leaky vaccines can promote the evolution of nastier hot viral strains that put unvaccinated individuals at greater risk. But in this case, the vaccines appear to be so leaky, it puts everyone at risk once again. But the concern now is the next generation of vaccines. Remember, this article is 2015. Uh, if the next generation of vaccines are leaky, they could drive the evolution of more viral and strains of the virus. He said, quote, it is critical now to determine quickly as possible that the Ebola vaccines that are now in clinical trials are not leaky. Yeah, now remember, we're now to 2021. They completely prevent transmission of the Ebola virus among people. So what he's implying is, you may have a vaccine that has some efficacy, but do not incorporate that vaccine unless it is perfect. Otherwise, you could have unintended consequences. Quote, we do not want the evolution of viral diseases as deadly as Ebola evolving in the direction that our research has demonstrated is possible to be less than perfect. And again, that is just hyperbole in reference to the uh, today. But however, though, it does appear that the vaccines which are here are, are not uh, perfect. You understand? Again, that's where we want to head forth. And this is a great little article. Uh, if you read about this individual here, and I'm going to link this as well, because even though he's pro getting vaccinated, uh, it 
I want to bring the attention to MedPage today because it's really a great science site that is not one way or the other. Like, oh my God, who's getting paid for it? The news, they love it. They love that stuff, you guys. But here's the interesting th truth. Look what happened in Great Britain. All right, I'm linking here to an article by David Wallace-Wells. What he lays out is in Great Britain, they had their Delta surge starting in May. And we're having a Delta surge now. And what they found were the cases were rising dramatically. People started to freak out. Now, this is a highly vaccinated population, more so than U.S., actually above like, you know, 60 percentage. We're like a close to 50 now, I believe. And what they found was it went like this. The cases plummeted. In fact, one of the top epidemiologists, Neil Ferguson, was like, well, you know, it appears that we're going to be having hundreds of thousands of cases a day. Again, it's inevitable. Quote, except the only thing that was inevitable was that he was wrong. Yeah, and like a lot of predictions you see in the paper, it's gloom and doom, and it's great for media. Uh, and I personally believe it's ir not responsible. I understand the fear motivation, but it doesn't appear to be doing much good. It seems to be turning people off. All right, now let's go into our fun studies, positive stuff. Potential COVID-19 medication found among tapeworm drugs. This is amazing. Salis salicylonides. 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 We were first discovered, remember, it's 2 19 a.m. I go into this cold. We were first discovered in Germany in the 1950s and used to address warm infections in cattle. Versions including the drug niclosamide, which we actually read about earlier, are used in animals and humans to treat tapeworm. They've also been studied for anti cancer and antimicrobial properties. One compound stood out, dubbed simply number 11. Isn't that cool? It sounds kind of like, like mystery like. It differs from the, uh, the commercial taper medicines in key ways, including the ability to pass beyond the gut and be absorbed into the bloodstream and without the worrisome toxicity. Now, here's an interesting correlation. A lot of the medications and potential treatments for COVID, a lot of them, for example, they take like ivermectin, like for river blindness and things like that, uh, seem to be deworming agents or antiparasiticals. Isn't that weird for virus that so many antiparasiticals seem to have this antiviral, antimicrobial capability? It, it just, it's intriguing to me. Quote, well, about 80% of salicylonide salicylon, 11 pass into the bloodstream. Now you're going to figure out why they didn't want to use this antiparasitical before. Exactly for the reason it did pass in the bloodstream. Compared to about the 10% of the antiparasitic drug, niclosamide, niclosamide, which has recently entered clinical trials as a COVID-19 treatment. The compound's antiviral mechanism is the key. It blocks the viral material from getting out of the endosome, and it just gets degraded. This process does not allow the new viral particles to be made as readily. Importantly, because it acts inside the cell rather than on viral spikes, Questions about whether it would work in the new variants like Delta and Lambda aren't a concern, are not a concern, because it's not working on the spikes, it's working on inside the cell. In addition, number 11, dub number 11, help quiet potentially toxic inflammation in the research animals, which could be important for treating acute respiratory distress associated with life-threatening COVID infections. It reduced levels of interleukin-6, a signaling protein, which is a key contributor of inflammation typically found in advanced stages of COVID-19. And so it's really intriguing. Now, the main reason they did not approve this, uh, use it, uh, this is right here. Let me, let's go to the end quote here. The salicylonide 11, not that I can see why they just want to call it number 11, actually was placed in the back burner of my laboratory against C. diff because it is not as gut restricted as we'd like it to be. But we'll just call it number 11, has got a lot of really positive things for its potential therapeutic effect. So because it was not gut restricted, why was it not gut restricted? Because about 80% of it passed into the bloodstream. But there is the paradox in the irony. The fact that it does pass into the bloodstream made it very effective in potentially in blocking certain viruses and associates with COVID-19. To proceed to the next one, that's, that's a cool one. I, 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 again, four to three weeks have done this, and we've covered multiple 
positive treatments. We don't see them being utilized yet, but it would be nice. So let's record it for, um, how would you say, for later on. A license, licensed drug could reduce, and these are medications already on the market. Licensed drug could reduce SARS-CoV-2 infection by up to 70% reveal study. Another cool one. A licensed drug normally used to treat norm, abnormal levels of fatty substances in the blood could reduce infection caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus by up to 70%. Reels reveal reveals a study in laboratory by an international collaboration of researchers. Importantly, reduction of infection was obtained using concentrations of the drug which were safe and achievable using standard clinical dose of uh, phenylfibrate. Phenylfibrate, which is approved for use by most countries in the world, including the FDA and UK's National Institute for Health and Care, is an oral drug currently used to treat conditions such as high levels of cholesterol and lipids in the blood. They found the phenylfibrate reduced infection by up to 70%. Additionally, unpublished data also indicates that phenylfibrate is equally effective against newer variants. Again, wonderful broad spectrum medications which are out there, including alpha and beta and research going on in the efficacy of the delta variant. So again, another potential tool, which hopefully is not shelved, but again, the future is looking pretty bright. I mean, obviously it looks like for example, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be endemic in the environment, but you know, two or three years from now, actually probably two or three months from now, if the door is opened up to good research, man, what a tremendous toolbox of, uh, of basically potential uh, prophylactics which are available for use, as well as other things for mitigation, heat, ozone, UV light, so on and so forth. Now, this article, this next one, is so counterintuitive to what we've heard for so many months. But you ready for this? Check this out. Antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 remain stable or even increase seven months after infection. Levels of IgG antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS spike protein remain stable or even increase seven months after infection. Remember, we're still learning, this is still fairly new, but this is actually cool. The results published in Nature Communications also support the idea that pre-existing antibodies against the common cold coronaviruses, in which case, if you're not aware, if you worry about variants, I think that last record, there were 200 variants of the common cold coronavirus that could protect us against COVID-19. This is the first study to evaluate antibodies as large panels. So just to get an idea, I like how they, they actually, they made it so much easier because they bolted everything. They did it, not I. Uh, it goes to forward. Rather surprisingly, we even saw an increase in IgG anti-spike antibodies in 75% of the participants. So three quarters of participants actually saw an increase. Now, as opposed to the vaccine resistance, which seems to drop significantly after three months. I don't say that to knock those who become vaccinated. I say that because of the leaky vaccine scenarios and hopefully to encourage more less leaky vaccines. All right, to proceed. It goes, without any evidence of re-exposure to the virus. You see that? An increase in IgG anti-spike antibodies in 75% of the participants from month five onwards without any evidence of re-exposure to the virus. No reinfections were observed in the cohort. Regarding antibodies against human cold viruses, commonly known as HCOV, the results suggest that they can confer cross-protection against COVID-19 infection or disease. People who were infected by SARS-CoV-2 had lower levels of HCOV bodies. So you see what I mean? All right, you see what that means? The people that were infected with SARS didn't have as many uh, antibodies against the cold. So ironically, you could take individuals which are not getting out as much, with not that much exposure, and of course, they had less antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 because they had less antibodies against the human cold coronaviruses. Real important aspect here, children which are not in school and not being surrounded with other kids, not being exposed to a lot of things in the environment, uh, not getting as many colds may sound like a great thing, but why would you want to trade a very mild infection for something which is not as mild? 
Uh, moreover, asymptomatic individuals had high levels of anti-HCV, so mean also if you got it, and you had higher levels of the basically the antibodies against the cold, uh, you were more likely to be asymptomatic. Although cross-protection by pre-existing immunity common cold viruses remains to be confirmed, this could help explain the big difference in susceptibility to disease within the population. That is cool. All right, to proceed forward. LED lights. Again, I just want to bring the attention. I really, really would like to see LED lights being utilized, especially ones which are safe, inexpensive, and environmentally friendly at the wavelength of 222 nanometers, which are being incorporated in many parts of the world as a disinfectant in bars, schools, public arenas. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, it's, we need to get past utilizing masks and distancing. We're, you know, this is not the 1300s during the Justonian plague. This is 2021. I mean, we can go, but why are we reverting back to 1300 uh, plague maintenance, draconian plague maintenance, Justonian? draconian plague maintenance things you know we're an advanced society you know we may have got caught off guard but the technology is out there incorporated the link will be there as follows and of course rheumatic disease this is important for individuals which are on a lot of uh, uh, immunosuppressants now as well keep in mind the immunosuppressants i didn't have the article here they can cause what's uh, interesting is called non-vaccine responders and non-vaccine responders is occurring more and more, especially as the, the vaccines are being spread out to a greater and greater uh, levels. And, you know, that's the concern, for example, with individuals within the HIV uh, community. Uh, they uh, can be non-vaccine responders and more prone. So I think it's something that people have to come to terms with, that other medical treatments need to be investigated Uh to help those communities out as opposed to putting all of our eggs in one basket and not being where it should be. All right, let's see, proceed as follows. We actually get some time. All right, well, we're, now this is part of a data source, health.gov, just going around. Um, also, too, the, the claim that they peaceful that have been peaceful, peaceful, the people have been fully vaccinated, um, uh, have not perished from. COVID-19 uh, is erroneous and all being small groups, for example, this was July 7th, the Polish study, uh, they are beginning, if you look at the data here, can you see that? 14 days after the second dose, the deaths. And so again, this, it, so it's not right. Uh, since there's no, so much new technology and research out there, just start, start sitting on our laurels and say, look what we got. This is all we need. Uh, no, it's it's not, it's not appropriate to just uh, deceive the public in reference to its protective ability. If there are other things around the corner that can help, uh, then we should be pursuing that. But as far as the misnomer of individuals which have been fully vaccinated, uh, now remember there's different vaccines and things like that, but regardless of that, uh, that claim uh, is inaccurate. All right. And now we'll go to our data sources. Let's go to our, uh, our European database first. I want to give you an example. For those which are not familiar, all right, if you go to the Eura, this is for our, our data our data researchers. Go to the Eura Villagence European database. This is where you're going to find the information on the COVID-19 vaccines. They're going to have the same disclaimer we have for Veros. Again, these all need to be investigated. But let us proceed as follows. All right, so here we go. Uh, so we understand reports, we go to search right here. Then what you do, I know it's not easy to follow, and you go to see. But there's some strengths of the database we'll cover in a little bit. And you scroll down and let's see, do, 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 do. Let's see, we go to search, wrong one. It goes to this one, see? And that's the wrong one too. So this one, <laughs> see? There, here we go. All right, so here we go. I want to show you how to see it on its own, not to become reliant on me, because I, I don't, I mean, I want, I don't mind trusting, but I also want you to verify, okay? And this way, you feel more confident in the knowledge that you know as well. So let's go to the COVID. Scrolling down, this is how you find the COVID reactions. All right, and so here we are. So what you do is we look at their database, 
And Uniseeth, for example, AstraZeneca, they have different names for their medications. Uh, I don't know why the aliases like Moderna is now called uh, Spike something. Uh, and so if you go through the list, for example, go back down to their database and you see, for example, COVID, uh, there's different names. There's the Pfizer one, you, the, it's the AstraZeneca, the Janssen, you'll find them all. And you can see the reactions up here. And if you add up all the reactions between the four vaccines that they use in Europe, uh, it's gonna come up to 802,786 reactions reported to the BIT database as of August 8th. And so that's gonna lead us right into our Python data analytics. So let's look at the European databases. Now there's one thing that's interesting about their databases. So if you go here and they're overly simplified, so let's take the Jan, let's take one a little more uh, robust. Let's look at the AstraZeneca. So if we look at, let's one, maybe one that you're familiar with here in the United States. Uh, Moderna, the Pfizer, everyone knows the Pfizer. There's the Pfizer. All right, and so let me just make sure here. Pfizer, yeah, because again, they all go into aliases. It's like trying to find, you know, somebody on, you know, that's running from the law. Uh, nope, don't want me to say it like that because that sounds, you know, that sounds not right. Uh, so let's see if we're going to Scotland Yard looking for Pfizer. All right, so there's Pfizer, otherwise known as Tazin and Marin. All right, and if you look at the reactions, all you got to do is right here, and you can easily see, for example, as it pops up eventually someday, there you can see, nope, Let's go individual reaction by cases. There we go. And again, please forgive the the uh, time here uh, as far as that. Normally, the reactions would show up. And if the reactions showed up, that's, no, I guess not do that one. Let's just do this one, Moderna. There it goes. You see right here. And what happens is it's very generalized. You can click on this and you can switch to a table, which makes it a little easier to read. And of course, nothing is cooperating. All right, well, what ends up happening is you can see how this is more difficult to read uh, per se, but if this was working, hey, this is not my data table. This is, this is the European Union's data table. And whatever, you can get it. Is it going? Is it popping up? No. Wow. It's slow. All right. But regardless, there's, here's Janssen's only 21,000 cases. Reactions by this should be faster. It's only 21,000. And there it goes. See, it comes up like a table like this. And you could break that down, and it's a lot easier to utilize. You can even uh, import it uh, for your reading to either Excel or another type of thing. But you see right there, that, that gives you a good overall look at it. Now let's go into the databases as hand. I wanted to give you a source of information for the fact checker. So if you need to start checking facts, we'll just call them information guardians. Fact checker sounds silly. All right, uh, Ministry of Truth, if you want to be kind of Orwellian. All right, let's see, here we go. Uh, let's go into the European databases. So we're going to go deeper dive into the reactions real fast. All right, so as we go into the reactions, we're looking at all the vaccine groups. We're adding them together. And the vaccine uh, reactions are all in one column, but they're not, they're, they're broken into break lines and things like that. So they take a lot of cleaning. And for example, so this is going to be the serious reactions, the most common serious reactions of the vaccines being utilized in Europe. Now, the interesting part about it, it's going to be different than the reactions in the United States to some extent. They're picking up one reaction reporter more often than anything else, arthralgia, and severe joint pain. So it's really weird. Now, this is serious reactions for the EU. Let's see if I can back this up too, so it's a little easier we can read the whole thing. All right, let's go a little further back. Come on, one more. There's that, all right, see right there? There is the serious reactions. And you could see this is the top line there. 
And if we go to our VARES database, wow, look how small the things are there. Right, let's see if we can go to our database here. Let's see where we are currently. If you look at our reactions here in the United States, our reactions, like we have different reactions. Uh, you see, headache, chills, fatigue, dizziness. And it's really unusual because the number one thing, we don't have it here, but I don't know why, for correlation, why in Europe, look, as I'm trying to find this like little line there, they got it. Why joint pain and things like that are more prominent in their serious reactions. You could see the uh, death spelled palsy. They caught that way ahead of time. Herpes zoster, contusions, pulmonary embolisms. You know, these are the serious ones. Now, I also broke the database down into the, uh, them uh, into overall. You know the most common reactions period and here you see COVID as well too and again a lot of COVID through cases per se as well even in the vaccinated so let's look at all all right and this is all right so again you can read the little things here and good luck it's gonna be in 4k but even in 4k good luck all right that's the most common let's make this a little let's so let's start here because it'd be faster again this is the number of reactions right and so a subset of these were really serious joint pain and so on and so forth. And so here's all the reactions they have. Again, headache is number four. Fatigue, chills, joint pain, so on and so forth down the line. Uh, anaphylactic reactions, herpes zoster, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, you know, that's interesting. Now, again, here, could that be maybe because of poor administration of the vaccine. Maybe they're, they're creating issues with CERVA. But it is interesting when you look at the, the differences in, you know, the, vac the vaccine reports. Uh, we don't even have, we have pain here. That could be the joint pain, but it's not even toward the top there. But again, I digress. So let's go back into the serious one real fast, the database. There's that. The word cloud it represents basically what's happening most often, most often reported. And so, and then we go into the, um, the all, doo -doo -doo, and there's all reactions, and there's the word cloud as well. Let's make this a little bigger now, doo -doo -doo, with sound effects. And that's what's most common, is the size of the word, uh, more common the reaction, even though this is a lot easier to read. Uh, but you get it all across the board. So that's the European database. I'll start adding that every week until this story becomes, this event becomes uh, mitigated on its own. So let's begin first. Let's go into the VAERS database itself. And again, with a disclaimer, which we read earlier, these are just reports reported to. You see how the language can be so different. That's where people mess up. Reported to and reported or come out two different ways. Reported to means it needs to be investigated. Reported could sometimes be implied that it is um, it is actually a report. So this is reported to needs verification. 3,182 cases of serva. Reported to. Shingles, 11,552. Remember we looked at the European database and they had just as, they had a high number as well. Bell's palsy, 5,123 reactions reported to. Uh, going down the list, thrombocytopenia, 2,761. Again, if you want to read these, you can. And I'll make them a lot larger if you want me to. Uh, for example, these read all the Bell's palsy here, uh, locked jaw and things like that that occur in individuals. Paralysis, 4,217 cases reported to VARES. Myocarditis, again, this still is weird because the age is so low, 4,108 cases of myocarditis reported to VARES. See, most of the reactions, for example, right in the middle here, this is like way down there. So that's like somehow it has a really real propensity, uh, these reports uh, being uh, affecting younger individuals or younger individuals are more likely to report it to VARES. Thrombosis, 6,594 cases reported to. Do, 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 do. COVID illness reactions. Now, this is going to be break now. Again, I don't know if this happens to the first shot or the second shot, but 61,077. Were they infected before getting vaccinated? I don't know. Again, the CDC is overwhelmed. 
tons of information, and they stopped tracking breakthrough cases as well, unless it was a serious event of hospitalization, as covered by Bloomberg. So basically, there we are, average age. Duplicate VARA's IDs. I, I made this recommendation. I'll rake it again. Uh, obviously, the CDC was counting duplicate effects, uh, which, brought, which gave way to having more death reports than actually there were. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but however, though, to, to the accuracy in order to make our argument with a for or against a certain issue is better than if it's not embellished because it will come back to bite whomever. Uh, Vera's IDs. These are the top duplicated IDs. Duplicated? Duplicated. It's 244, I can say duplicated. Uh, and that's the IDs if you want to reference. And they will show reports very much like this. Tons and tons and tons because you only can fit one, two, three, four, five symptoms per report. They should need, they need to make that bigger. And so what ends up happening is you end up with a lot of duplicates because they'll take this individual here had a very, very, very hard time, but they filled out. This is nine. This is uh, five one one five nine two, so to say. No, they're not even up in the top top one as far as number of reports. No, sorry, it's one four zero six two three. Sorry, there they are. I apologize. There they are. They're the, the top duplicate reporter. All right, and then we go down the line here. Again. For expedi uh, wow, it's a lot of space for expediency. Let's keep on going. Uh, vaccine reports by vaccine. This is supposed to be July 23rd. Let's see. If, so let's fix that real fast. This way next time we can catch up. All right. Let's go down. COVID vaccine reaction reports by age. Look how this is becoming right skewed. Before, when it first started, it was left skewed. Now it's moving down this way. So it's becoming right skewed. You see? Or I should say left skewed. Forgive me. Either way. Still, you know what I mean. It's moving that way, which is not good. All right, to proceed. Uh, COVID vaccine related deaths reported too. Again, the CDC corrected their figures more in line with ours. Uh, and we only go to the beginning of 2021. And all they have to do is count the Y's. If it says death, you just count the Y's. Tally up the Y's, and that will give you the number of vaccine-related deaths reported to the CDC. All right, and to proceed forward, uh, by week, less reports seem to be coming out. I know that timestamp looks miserable. Um, and there is COVID mortality to vaccine-reported mortality. Let's go down the line here, see if there's any more information, which is any different than we normally report. All right, see this one I fixed. July 30th, what am I saying July 23rd for? Number of vaccine reports, uh, reaction reports compared to all of 2020. You see the amount of work cut off of the CDC? 57,115 for all of 2020, 437,295, duh. 437,295 for up to this point of August, uh, July 30th, I should say, 2021. All right, it's going down the line, going down the line. All right, reactions. This is our word chart, just like we showed the European Union way. Our most common reactions, top 30 report reactions. Then we have to scroll this down a little bit. It's going to bounce around for a second. Yeah, there it went. All right, whoops, we went backwards. Um, that's the most common ones. No, sorry. Well, it bounced really far. These are the symptoms of all ages. All right, these are most common symptoms. Uh, these are the deaths. Most common things reported individuals who passed on. Uh, possibly, possibly in reference to vaccine reports. Uh, top 30 reactions of those that have perished in reference to the vaccine. Cardiac arrest is up there. COVID-19 and COVID-19 pneumonia. Add these two together and the, the irony is you'd probably have COVID-19 uh, reaction being reported as one of the as possibly even passing this one. Uh, reaction by age reports and minors. It's now, it's, you're seeing 11 year olds and 12 year olds. So over a thousand 12 year olds uh, based, actually 
uh, had uh, some sort of um, adverse event reported to Veras. If I pause from time to time, it's because I'm really being careful how I word something. A lot numbers, uh, the most, the greatest association between reports and lot numbers. Uh, number one report in children, uh, as far as word cloud wise, and there's chest pain, fatigue, headache, and dizziness, and other ash, uh, aspects in reference to reports in individual children under the age of 19. The what's the way I broke up the uh, the database. All right. And as predicted, uh, what's happened is as you become to try and vaccinate more and more resistant or hesitant individuals, uh, hypothesis when we first made this chart was you want to get more reactions. Or it could be also be too, it could be a little confounding as you're vaccinating people which are immunocompromised uh, at the same time too, which would be more reluctant as well, but yet want to be vaccinated, uh, you run a higher risk of uh, greater reaction reports. So the red line is reports, blue line is number one is being vaccinated. You see, there was actually less people in May uh, making reports, even though more people were being vaccinated. And look, at see how this line, these are the hesitant, these are reluctant, and more likely to obviously possibly correlate to um, be more vaccine sensitive. Um, vaccine reports adverse by week. This is weird. Looks like some data dumping. And let's just move on to the next one real fast. Go to mutations. Here's our argument. Ready? Our analysis. You are trying to figure out whether the vaccine has any impact on mitigating the pandemic. Again, what we're going to do is look at the data and I'll make this a little bigger. You make the determination, not I. Here we go. Just based upon the data. Here's our variant trends the past 10 weeks. Delta's up there. Everything else is pretty much low. This is August 1st. You see right there. What do you think? United States, deaths per million. 1.5. There's your Delta variant. Pretty much taking up the entire board. This is 100%. All right. Uh, positivity rate. I don't know why it broke off into not a numbers mid-July, but there it is. Positivity rate began to cl climb. There's your Delta variant. Almost 100%. Fully vaccinated individuals, keep in mind this is scientific notation. So there you are. But we have a little bit better chart here. Uh, population to fully vaccinated in the United States. Now, you know I like controls. So you ready for the control? Here comes our control. Our control is going to be India. Look at Delta, skyrocketed. Everything else seemed to just went down the past 10 weeks. Deaths per million in India. What are you looking at? 0.3 deaths per million in the United States. 1.5. Now, I know you can say reporting and things like that, but again, these are technologically advanced countries. So this is, this is pretty accurate. I know people like to think not, but remember, no, they're pretty accurate. Deaths per million in India, 0.3. That's how our mind discounts things. Oh, it can't be right. It has to be wrong. You know, and like, you know, like we don't have any sort of a, the data collection problems ourselves, as noted from the Bloomberg report right off the bat. Deaths per million in India. Positivity rate. Positivity rate is what? Almost none? Now, what was the positivity rate in the United States? 0 0.04. Positivity rate, India. 0.02, would you say? Delta variant is predominant. Now, surely India must be fully vaccinated in order to have numbers so low and so good compared to the United States. So India must be totally vaccine compliant. Au contraire. Are you ready? There it is. Population of India, percent in comparison, number of people fully vaccinated. Is that confounding or what? Vaccination rate was last week was 7.7% of the total population. Yet, look. Now, we're going to throw in Sweden because I like Sweden. And there's our variant, Delta. They're kind of in the middle. But again, it's, it's, uh, I want to be fair. New deaths per million, Sweden. All right. 
You're looking at that. Pretty close to none deaths per million. Now, remember, we're not talking deaths over, deaths per million. So we are comparing apples to apples. Remember how we were bad and sweeting in the beginning? Oh, they weren't doing this. They weren't doing that. They had loose lockdown things. Remember how Fauci and, and, and Paul were arguing out in center and he goes, oh, but they're Scandinavian. I don't know what that meant. But however, though, must mean something. There it is. Positive rates in Sweden. Not close to the United States, I'd say. You know, just the way the Y-axis looks. Uh, vaccination, a little less than 50%. But the numbers are confounding. So, again, I can include more countries or whatever it is, but you have to make that decision. And, you know, is, you know, India... Not to say if it works, uh, unless India is somehow some sort of massively overpopulated outlier... Um, yeah, there's some there's some interesting aspect. I mean, we like to correlate things working, and it sounds great because we get virtue signaling, and everyone's doing this and that and the whole lineup and rah rah rah. But you know, going with the crowd doesn't mean you're necessarily right, especially when you have uh, perplexing information as such. All right, let's go into real fast. Let's yeah, you know, with 56 minutes, let's see if we get this done in an hour. Uh, let's go to hospital occupancy because we really want to look at Florida, California, New York. All right, I know California is back into mask world again. Inpatient beds used by COVID, right there. And I think our data is up to date. Yeah, our data is up to date. And so there we are. Inpatient beds used, California. So now, I mean, you're looking. Now, looks, now, watch this. Look at this. You see that rise? You see that rise? You see, the, you see almost that exact correlation? New York, a little different. But you see, for example, this is again up to the seventh. Uh, Delta variant doesn't seem to be doing anything for them. Delta variant has an impact in California. Delta variant doesn't seem to be doing much with New York. But here we'll go with Florida. Florida's experiencing Delta variant. But you see this, the rise. The rise. The, does any of this pandemic lockdown mitigation make any difference whatsoever? If you're, if you're basically following almost the exact seasonal pattern we did a while ago. All right, here we go. And I don't know about natural exposure and things like that, but again, we're talking about hospitalization, so we're talking about individuals which could become reinfected over and over again. Are these kids, adults? Who are the people being hospitalized? That's what I would like to know. Arkansas, I don't know what that was back then, but you see the correlations? It's like a small wave. And of course, North Dakota, Mississippi, same thing, same thing. Again, does the pandemic make a difference? Same thing, same thing. And that's Texas. All right, it's the same wave. And if you were a gambler, obviously, and you saw this wave and this pattern, and you knew that SARS-CoV-2 was going to be endemic in society, uh, now think about it, the number of people which are vaccinated. All right? So think about this. You have no vaccine here, the vaccine here, and you're following the exact same pattern, regardless of the variant. Look at it algorithmically, because Montana is just Montana. They could be themselves. You know, if you're looking at that, you could build a machine learning model off of that. We could use a survival analysis, a Cox pH fitter model. We can do whatever. New York obviously had a greater initial exposure, so they're a little bit different. Uh, so basically, you know, you can do that. Does that mean January should be higher across the board? January, 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 potentially. Uh, does that mean the mitigation impact is working or not working? I can't make a determination from this. Anybody could say, oh, it would have been a lot worse uh, if there was that Lindsey Graham. Oh, if I, if I didn't get vaccinated, it would have been a lot worse. Is he right or wrong? I don't know. Are studies being done? I don't know. I mean, with the virological loads, yes, and as you show, it does clear faster, but is that the case for him? Not everyone does. So, again, it just, I don't know. But there's your potential trend. All right, now let's go back into states real fast, and we'll wrap it up. Here we go. Do, 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 do. All right, and look at real slow is your hospitalizations across the board. Uh, this is a little tougher to read, but let's scroll down. We're just going to glance through this. You're not going to see anything really different because I couldn't find it either. Hospital patient beds with COVID total patient beds. One second, nothing else there. Good. Uh, 
looking for any dramatic increase and rises. And if the objective was to flatten the curve, can you tell any curve? Do you see any curve? Except the ones I showed you on the other article there, which is a little different, but still just the same. These are all hospitalizations overall, even though the, the y-axis tends to change. Deaths per 100,000, you can see a little bit of spike in certain areas on very low numbers. Moving slow. Do -do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. Louisiana. Florida, West Virginia went up and then just went down. Yeah, this could go on forever. Uh, new deaths per 100,000 in the States, it's overall. Um, ba -ba -ba. What is that? Uh, deaths per 100,000 smooth. New Jersey, Rhode Island, Arizona, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Alabama, South Dakota, Louisiana, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Arkansas. You know, they're all blasting Arkansas. Oh, you're not fully vaccinated. Well, look, the, the deaths per 100,000 tend to be, in, I mean, those are a lot higher than, than Arkansas. All right, let's go. Mortality, new cases, smooth, 100,000. A little rise, but what you have is you have a few states here that make, that are outside the norm, just to pay attention. Oh, no one can read that. Uh, and so on and so forth. So let's cut, let's wrap it up. You ready? So bottom line, we looked at our mutations. Uh, we looked at India's positivity rate and also looked at India's vaccination rate and compare it to the United States and so on and so forth. We looked at, ba -ba -ba, da -da 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 -da. we looked at, let's go backwards, uh, pneumatic and uh, mucoskeletal diseases. This says 11% of the patients required treatment with that had rheumatic or muco, mu mucoskeletal disease. Uh, so just keep that in mind for those individuals who are getting vaccinated, it's not a fun ride. I reference to that, but again, it can be life-saving, but again, you have to know all the ins and outs, especially for medical professionals. If you're vaccinating somebody and they're walking into basically, you know, the average, you know, you know, convenience store to get a vaccine uh, and they have an immunological issue or rheumatic disease, such as lupus or arthritis or whatever, uh, best to be done in a hospital as opposed to, you know, someplace that's not hospital-like. LED lights, I use them. We do a lot of shipping and things like that. I make sure all the boxes at night are all basically exposed to UV light at the 202 or 254 nanometer length. As long as no one's around, I use the 254. But I use them. I've been using them from the beginning. Uh, antibodies, common cold, maybe not so bad to be exposed to it. And the interesting part about it, the confounding here, uh, is the fact that the individuals actually started, 75% of them actually had more antibodies, even though not being re-exposed to the virus many months later on. I'll have the link to the article here as well. Uh, looked at the medication, phenofibrate, looks really cool. Looked at the other deworming agent, salicylanilide. salicylanilide. Yeah, that was just number 11. Incredible. Another antiparasitical medication which seems to have a strong promise in reference to SARS CoV 2. Went to the various database, disclaimer. Uh, great little article explaining how inaccurate the CDC was on many of their models, but at the same time, too, uh, if it be in a medical professional, he really does a great job putting people at ease. Number three, um, some vaccines support evolution of more virulent viruses. This was done in 2015. I'll see if I can get you a link to the original article, uh, but still just the same. Uh, it, it, gives, it gives pause, reason to pause. Let's put it that way. And then excellent article from Bloomberg. And I always appreciate good reporting, even though it may not be virtue signaling. Uh, however, though, they broke it down and they got the quotes and it ended as follows. And I will read that meant like, unlike with previous variants, vaccinated people are more likely to spread the disease. I have nothing against vaccines or not being vaccinated, but still I really like information. And sometimes the more conflicting it is, uh, the more intrigued I am by it. That meant that unlike with previous variants, vaccinated people are more likely to spread the disease and more easily to unvaccinated individuals than those who are vaccinated but vulnerable of their age or health. And I think this should be especially 
intriguing to individuals setting military policy out there for our service people. If the vaccine is not preventing infection or transmission, and especially in healthy young individuals, which will chances are uh, may overcome regardless, uh, why expose our service people to something where the risk is far greater than the benefit? Just as food for thought. And with that, good night. It is now 3.03 a.m. I always enjoy doing this, 43 weeks of this so far. Again, I'll have all the links. Give me about a few days. It's the 8th right now, so about, about the 10th or 11th. I have all those links set up. And as one, as always, thank you. Humble, And I'm always humbled. Anybody that goes 65 minutes with me on this or 66 minutes, gratitude, thank you. And I look forward to, forward to doing this for all of you next week once again. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye-bye.